be doing. Lewin Marling will be discussing the consensus lexicon that she has been working on um, lately or the, over the last several months. And then Saskia Ozendarp and Sonia Hess are not with us today, but they have been very instrumental in guiding the project and helping us get started as is the rest of the micronutrient forum secretariat. Many of them are on here today um, and have stayed up late to be with us. So we really appreciate their support as well. So I will, we can go to the next slide and I'll pass it over to Reed to give an overview of the micronutrient forum. Hi, Megan. Uh, thank you and welcome to everybody joining the call. We're pleased to be able to introduce the Micronutrient Forum to those of you who might not know it or reintroduce it to those of you who might just think of the forum as a conference. Um, so the Micronutrient Forum was founded in 2006 and reconstituted as an independent 501c3 uh, about three years ago. Since that time, we've increased our programmatic work while the organization has remained its focus sitting at the intersection of research, policy, and implementation. Um, we continue to host our Hallmark Global Conference with the 2020 event being held virtually due to the pandemic, and we're currently planning our 2023 event for sometime in uh, August or September of next year with a theme of Nutrition for Resilience. So while the forum does not implement programs, we do seek to champion and equip decision makers to eradicate micronutrient deficiencies. We do that through the aforementioned conference, but also through our programmatic work, such as Standing Together for Nutrition, where we've looked, we've sought to create estimates of the impact of the global pandemic on global malnutrition, uh, and more recently, the impact of the crisis in Ukraine. We also have work streams involving uh, women's nutrition and the nutrition needs of um, pregnant and lactating mothers with healthy mothers, healthy babies. And we're currently developing activities uh, in anemia and child diets, really trying to round out our portfolio of work in um, various elements of global micronutrient malnutrition, where we think bringing together a diverse set of actors to align on uh, appropriate next steps can elevate the field. Uh, we are glad to have you here today, and uh, back over to you, Megan. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction to the forum. Um, I think if we go ahead a couple of slides, yep, we can go through that. Next slide. And next slide. And here we go. All right. So we're caught up. So it'd be really nice to hear from um, those of you who have joined us. And if you feel comfortable, please feel free to unmute yourself, um, turn on your camera if you like, or introduce yourself in the chat. It would be really nice to hear from you the name, your the organization you work for, uh, and the location where you are uh, calling in from today. And we also have a, a poll just to give you a little bit of uh, easy introductions to everybody to see where everyone fits within the micronutrient data ecosystem. So you can feel free to also um, answer these questions while we're going through introductions. Um, Ken, I see you've uh, turned on your camera. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm uh, Ken Brown. I'm an emeritus professor at the University of California, Davis, and uh, also a member of the board of the Micronutrient Forum. And I've just looked at your poll, but I think I'm interested in just about all of these areas. <laughs> Great. Um, Mary, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, hi. I'm, I'm Mary Penny. I'm a um, uh, investigator at the Instituto de Investigación Nutricional in in um, in Peru, in Lima, um, and um, actually I'm not currently working on um, on major nutritional projects, but <laughs> I was interested to listen to this. I have been working on um, uh, um, different 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 nutrition um, uh, problems in in in, in Peru. Um, I know when I'm interested in listening to hear what the latest is on on um, on what's going on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, 
because you, I'm, 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 in, I'm not sure how much I'm going to be able to contribute, but I'm interested in listening, <laughs> and we'll try and um, connect with the rest of the. I'm actually not a nutritionist, but with the with the people who are um, the nutritionists at the institute. Ken Brown knows them very well. <laughs> it's good, to, good to hear from you, Ken. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and anyone else like to introduce themselves? Don't be shy. We would really like to hear from everyone. Um, hi, Megan. So Hello. let me see. If, yeah, let me see if I can um, put my video. I mean, I'm out of Nairobi. I'm, I'm basically out of uh, good network. So I'm not so sure if my video will show. But I guess uh, as we just a moment. That's all right. We can hear you quite well. All right. So let's see if that shows up. Can you see me? Uh, yes, we do. All right. So um, my name is uh, Zipora Bukania. I work at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, uh, currently involved in um, developing tools for um, uh, food consumption data collection um, in anticipation for the National um, um, Food Consumption Survey. And of course, hopefully we can also do the National Micronutrient Survey subject to availability of funding. Um, so I've, I've looked at um, some of the questions that were in the poll, and I guess um, I fall in a few of those. Um, again, being in a research institution, of course, we also know that we are open to many other you know, gaps that might need research on, but a lot of um, um, involvement in program evaluation, um, not directly in food fortification, but of course we do evaluate how the food fortification uh, programs are also being undertaken and the challenges that are being fed in through research. Then we have some level of um, uh, nutrition or agriculture sensitive, nutrition sensitive uh, sort of interventions. And now I know one health is also becoming in as a very strong component, which we are involved in a little of those activities as well. Um, so I've worked, I work at the Center for Public Health Research, which is one of the departments of the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Med uh, the Kenya Medical Research Institute has 14 centers. And the center that I work in, which I'm also the director, is a center that um, accommodates nutrition-related activities. And I guess that's partly the reason that I'm participating in this discussion. Thanks, thanks for that. That's great, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's getting late there. Would anyone else like to introduce themselves or put information? Yes. Yes, I would like to. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Zanda from St. Lucia in the Caribbean. Um, professionally, I am on a few different paths. They do merge at different points in time. I am um, a food chemistry graduate focused on food innovation. Um, and my interest is really finding ways to uh, make healthy food more accessible and also providing um, nutrients um, through food or through um, fortification. Um, I'm very interested in this organization, this forum, um, especially since the focus is really on getting those micronutrients that are lacking to different parts of the world. Um, one concern that I do have is that um, the new food policies that are being moved across the world may target some of the foods which may fall into um, ultra processed or highly processed food category. So I am just trying my best to, you know, put myself in the different um, forums and the different environments to understand everybody so that um, I can apply to my product development work. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. And would anyone else like to introduce themselves? I will also go ahead and end the poll. Hopefully you've all had a chance to um, contribute to that and I'll share the results so you can just see um, what the others on the call are interested in. Um, I see a pretty broad range of the primary area of work, which is nice, um, as well as the type of um, nutrition interventions that you're involved in as well. 
And lots of you seem to be involved in data collection and analysis or interpretation. So that's also nice to see as well. Um, I will stop sharing this. And Hello, shall we... I introduce myself? Oh, please go ahead. <laughs> My name is Alida Melser. I'm um, an associate professor at the uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, I have worked all my life on micronutrients. I have a keen interest in um, micronutrient deficiencies and in particular bioavailability of micronutrients. So that's what I'm working on. And uh, since I heard from the DINA initiative, I have been very interested to uh, see what you are up to um, because the, the lack of data is, um, yeah, hampering the field to Pro progress and um, so I'm here to listen in and um, yeah looking forward to hear more. Wonderful thank you so much for joining us. Anyone else that we've missed or who hasn't had a chance? All right we will move on then and I'll give you an introduction to Dina uh, so the next slide please. One more slide there we go. All right. So the Micronutrient Data Innovation Alliance is currently a new project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and is housed under the Micronutrient Forum. And this project was started out of, um, you know, the longstanding realization that there are some problems with the micronutrient data ecosystem. And we've basically outlined these to be three different buckets of problems that we're seeing in this, what we're calling an immature data ecosystem. And one is that the reliable data is sparse, um, as some of you have already alluded to. And it's not simply having more data, but really having the right types of high quality data that are needed to justify and optimize micronutrient programs. And second, the availability or the available data that is there really needs to be better analyzed in many cases. We know that the micronutrient data landscape can be very fractured and lack some coordination um, as data may be housed in different groups um, and not always shared within a particular country or location, um, which kind of hampers its ability to be used among different uh, stakeholders. And there's also a lack of consensus on what data should be prioritized and how it should be defined and collected or shared. Um, so this is also a problem. The final sort of broad category that we've defined is that the existing analysis is not always used to inform national level policy and programming. Um, we've noticed from a lot of um, stakeholder interviews that policymakers sometimes don't understand the importance of micronutrient deficiencies and their impact on health outcomes and um, the extent to which interventions can actually help prevent um, these issues. So really trying to justify and advocate for um, data in the use for program planning and management. So really to solve these issues, we want to better identify and address deficiency. We really need to work together to more efficiently advocate for catalyzed funding, improved design and measurement of programs. And so if we go to the next slide, we really are aiming to improve the micronutrient and large scale food fortification data ecosystem as a whole. And we would really like to see accurate and more timely data being collected, um, the ability to interpret and analyze the data, the political will to act on it, and then the capacity and means to design, implement, and scale up nutrition interventions. So we really are hoping that Dina can help, uh, help the field by aligning on data priorities to implement change in a more coordinated manner. And so the next slide shows us kind of the, the approach or the current mission for DINA, which is um, an alliance of diverse members collaborating to improve the availability, quality, accessibility, and use of data across the value chain. And the real aim of this is to support national level decision makers in the hopes that data will help to be um, better design, implement, evaluate, and optimize programs and policies for nutrition. And so really, this is a, a supporting role to help um, the data ecosystem. Next slide. 
So right now we are in our launch phase. So that's part of why we're having these stakeholder discussions, as I mentioned. And so this is really to build consensus on what the priorities should be for Dina and to demonstrate value. This is why your feedback is so important. We are currently creating the scaffolding and membership. So there will be um, membership for the organization that can be individual or um, based on your organization. You can also sign up to be an observer. Um, this is basically, it's all free, so there's no cost, but just to kind of have a voice and uh, say in the priorities of the group, um, we would encourage you to be a member. And I think that will be put in the chat shortly as well. You can um, apply to be a member if you wish. There are now two activities that we're really undertaking in earnest to just get things started for Dina. And the first, as I mentioned, is a consensus lexicon for micronutrient and large scale food fortification terms. We'll hear much more about that from Lu and Mar, but we're also looking at a data gap and root cause analysis that Reed will be discussing as well. So these are kind of our two first uh, projects along with these stakeholder discussions. And then what we'll do in phase two is to really implement and catalyze um, the activities that the group has decided to prioritize. So next slide. Ah, yes. So here's a little bit more um, information on the governance structure that we're planning. Um, we are looking to have a steering committee that will oversee the strategic direction and annual work plan for DINA. And then we'll have subcommittees, which will really be the active working groups um, that we'll invite members to participate in, and whether this will be around creating guidance on conducting surveys or um, you know, supporting the lexicon development. Um, these will pan out as we kind of set out the mission of um, Dina. So if I'd like to pause now, and one of the things I'd really like feedback on is the overall model. Um, if there's any questions there. And then the other question that we have is really trying to maintain engagement of members in low and middle income countries and how best to do this. So we've heard some feedback from others that an honorarium might be helpful, but we've also heard that say travel support to the Micronutrient Forum Global Conference might be another way to help incentivize um, people to be engaged. So I will pause here and see if there's any feedback from the group on this or anything that I've mentioned. Um, yes, I do have a little bit of feedback concerning engagement of members in LMICs, considering that some of us are probably the, the hardest hit. Um, yeah, so the honorarium would be great. Um, and I'm honestly trying to think of other ways in which we can have more engagement, um, especially considering cultural differences, which impacts dietary differences. So um, encouragement of persons from LMICs, I think would be very, very important. Yeah, and I, Ideally, in forming the steering committee, we would really like it to be a majority from LMICs to really help drive um, some of those cultural differences as well to make sure that everyone has a say in things and we can really work um, effectively together. Any other thoughts? I think that the, oh, I don't know how to, God, <laughs> am I just barging in? But I, no, uh, go ahead, please. I think that, that um, the idea of, of subsidizing people to go to um, conferences is uh, um, would be very helpful in Peru. Wouldn't, uh, not, not me, but, but um, I mean, other, the younger, younger group of people coming up or uh, more actively involved perhaps. But it would be, I think that would help because, because it, it, is, it, it, it is expensive to travel. <laughs> yeah. So help in, in, in um, getting people to, to um, have to go to meetings and hear what was happening in other countries. Um, I'm getting a bit old myself, but the but the younger group, <laughs> would, uh, uh, I mean, it would be very helpful because you can see you then get ideas of what's going on in in, in other countries and what their problems are, and, and it helps you to to um, you know decide what could be done in Peru. Okay. I, I think that would be an excellent thing. Great, uh, Zephora, would you like to go? Yes, uh, thanks, thanks, Megan. So. 
I'm looking at the model in terms of membership, uh, there's organizational individual. And I want to speak from a point of um, the Kenya government um, and the current uh, ongoings as, an, as, a, as a country when it comes to issues around data. So there is tendency right now to strongly safeguard uh, data. And so I want to support the steering committee, including um, members from some of these countries so that then you get to know some of the limitations or the, the direction that has been provided by the legal frameworks on how data can be accessed, how it can be shared, and you know the, the challenges that generally come around data. And therefore then it, it helps the, in the governance of this alliance to ensure that then they are also aligned to the certain government um, regulations and guidelines and makes access to this data also much, much more easier. So in other words, I'm just in support that uh, the considerations for involvement and inclusion of uh, steering committee members from the LMICs will be something very useful. Um, I don't know what the subcommittees um, will be entailed, but I think that's also an area that needs to be quite um, uh, explored to ensure that in this, these subcommittee considerations, we are looking at the different challenges across the different LMIC countries, because we are all at different levels. But I think if you have very good committees that uh, put that into consideration, then we'll have um, sort of, um, you know, you'll probably get more feedback as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And we are hoping that the steering committee will also be diverse in the type of um, expertise and background. So whether people are academics or coming from the Ministry of Health, um, you know, to have a variety of backgrounds so that we can also hear some of the challenges from the national level as well from the government perspective. Um, Ken, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Megan. I was actually going to speak to the same issues that you and Sephora have just spoken to. And, and essentially, um, my observation and hearing from the few people who uh, introduced themselves is that most of the people on the call, at least those who spoke up, represent more of the research community. So more of the data collection and perhaps analysis side, as opposed to the application and interpretation of the data for program planning and, and monitoring. And so the, the question I have for you and, and the, the others on the, the call is how do we bring those other <laughs> representatives of the, the data value chain into this conversation, you know, focusing more on the data utilization side and making sure that the efforts that are being discussed around data collection are, are actually um, useful for program decision making. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And if we could go to the next slide, you can start to see an overview of the different program activities that we're envisioning um, and the different types of data activities. So this is sort of the way that we're organizing things as well as considering those different occupations. Um, but I would appreciate if anyone does have feedback on reaching that kind of other sector um, that's maybe a little bit more government focused or implementation oriented, um, that would also be most welcome. Yes, so more, yeah, so so um so if we are targeting to have um, utilization of this kind of data, just speaking to what Ken has mentioned right now in terms of um, who are in this data value chain and who are actually utilizing this information, and the government will always come on top of all this uh, because the role of government really is for us researchers to provide the information, the data, and the findings that gives them direction on what actions they need to take to address whatever gaps or challenges that have been identified with the research findings. So I think in our representation of the committees, we must make some deliberate um, effort to ensure that government, and, and not just government in terms of technical persons, but I think, and I don't know how the steering committees will be, will be staged because sometimes you can have levels of, of committees where you have the very high tech, you know, high level committees who are decision makers, but then you have the technical um, members of the committee who are at a lower level who basically are providing the information and the data that is required for purposes of discussions and, and, and probably analyzing the outcomes that inform the decision makers. So we must make a deliberate um, decision to have uh, uh, specific representations from government decision makers 
who are actually going to acknowledge the existence of this particular alliance. And therefore they will be falling back to it and saying, we are aware that this is happening. And for that reason, then we also need to align ourselves as a, as a government to ensure that we are benefiting from the process. Thanks. Great, that's really helpful too. And one thing that I'm not really mentioning here is we're sort of hoping to envision um, Dina will have some global level activities and then some very national level focused activities. Um, so finding locations with that enabling environment where they would be interested in, um, you know, participating more uh, in DINA or, you know, requesting assistance for data related projects. Um, that's something we'll also be on the lookout for. Any other thoughts or comments before we move on? So maybe yeah. I'll just, I, I may not, I don't know, um, I guess this is just the first meeting, but probably as we go along, we'll get to know, but I don't know whether there are any uh, intentions for ensuring um, a focus on data quality, because that's mm -hmm. one of our, our challenge, um, making sure that the data that is actually being collected, I don't know whether mechanisms will be there to ensure that that capacity is actually built that whatever data we get, we are able to concretely and comfortably make decisions using it. I think that's that's an area that can be considered as well. Yeah, we're absolutely hearing a lot of uh, need for capacity development. So I think that's very likely something that we'll take up to make sure that people are well-trained and comfortable with data and ensuring that there's good quality data as well. Um, that sounds like something we've heard a couple of times. So I really appreciate that. Uh, Alita, please go ahead. Yes, I, I was wondering what your strategy will be to get those people at the table that you need to have. Uh, I suppose you will do a stakeholder mapping exercise and, and an active reach out um, to people, won't you? Yes, absolutely. So one of the other things that I, I didn't mention in our early activities was a stakeholder mapping of sort of the, the global organizations and then sort of a, a general national uh, level stakeholder mapping um, to try and understand and make sure we're capturing each of the different perspectives that we really need to have. Absolutely. Yeah, because I th think that if you wait until people sign up by themselves, that will be a bit cumbersome, probably. Yes, yes, I agree. So we're kind of running with all of these in parallel. Um, but hopefully they'll they'll all converge in a nice place, I hope. All right, so we can go to my final slide for this part of the presentation. There we go. So I do encourage you to join as members. Um, Megan Sear from our group has added the link to the PDF file. Uh, and you can also just email it to us at Dina at micronutrientforum.org. It's there's a the email address is at the bottom of the form. We really encourage you to join us. Um, you can also see more information at our website, the micronutrientforum.org, and um, find more information there as well as in the shared folder that was um, in the chat as well. So you can find one page summaries on everything we're discussing today. So. I will now pass it over to Louis Marlang, who will discuss the consensus lexicon. And we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Good afternoon. Good morning and good night, everyone from the different regions who are joining this call. Uh, next slide, please. Let me just start with the justification on why do we need a data lexicon on micronutrient and last year food fortification. Because of the nature of the micronutrient programs that we all are aware, being engaged by multiple sectors and diverse stakeholders, there are some differences and inconsistencies in the use of terminology on the terms related to the micronutrients, which could finally uh, interfere with smooth communication. So to make sure that efficient communication as well as for the systematic use of the terminology, there is a need to develop a data lexicon on the terms for micronutrients and large-scale food fortification. As uh, Megan has just mentioned that one of the phase one activities under the dinner is to develop the micronutrient and large-scale food fortification data lexicon. Uh, the purpose of this effort is to serve as a central repository of consensus definitions 
and their related TAM, uh, data collection methods regarding the TAMs used in the micro-nutrient programs uh, with particular focus on large-scale food fortification. So we all aware that there are existing data platforms like Global Food Fortification Data Exchange and the WHO Vitamin and Mineral Nutrition Information System have specified the definitions on the micronutrient terms, but efforts are still needed to make sure those definitions to be uh, universally adopted or centrally accessible. Therefore, through the development of the micronutrient and LSFF data lexicon, a set of key terms and consensus definition will be assembled and made widely available to promote the uh, better communication and program transparency with emphasis on the importance of data meaningful for the programmatic decision making. Next, please. So this uh, micronutrient data lexicon will benefit a variety of stakeholders, including those who are already engaging in the field, like policymakers, government implementers, researchers, private sectors, technical support agencies, other professionals, and those in the adjacent sectors like agricultural sector, economic sector, and so on. In addition, the lexicon will also benefit to those who are new to the micronutrient field. And finally, the lexicon will help us to better design, implement, monitoring, and evaluation of the micronutrient and last skill food fortification program. Next slide, please. So to formulate the lexicon, we have identified a set of a key set, set of key terms on micronutrients and large scale food fortification from a variety of resources based on the programmatic implication that is assessment, planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. The resources include normative agencies like WHO, FAO, WFE, uh, UNICEF of the United, United Nations, as well as the US Institute of Medicine and also implementation and technical support agencies like GAME, Nutrition International, PATH, and of course from the scientific and technical literatures as well. Based on those different resources, we have recorded the relevant terms on the micronutrients and LSFF and linked them with the respective citations that we have uh, referenced for those terms. And then we have reviewed the definitions of these terms and we made uh, some modification whenever needed to the original definition. For example, if the original definition comes from flower fortification, then we have made the revisions to the original definition so that our proposed definition for the lexicon will reflect or cover all food vehicles, not just restricted to flour or salt, like something like that. And in case of multiple definitions among different resources, then we listed all the different uh, definition and check for the consistency across different sources. And then we have proposed the most appropriate definition for the lexicon. We have also applied appropriate keywords for each term. For example, uh, the keyword uh, nutrient reference value have applied for, has applied for the terms like average requirement, estimated average requirement, uh, dietary reference intake, and tolerable level of upper intake, something like that. And we have also categorized the terms based on the programmatic implication. The assumption we made was if we want to design and implement the micronutrient programs, we should start with the assessment of the existing situation, like some, something situation analysis, for example, assessment of individual dietary intake level, bio, biomarker micronutrient status assessment, and population assessment on the food vehicle consumption or preference, and existing uh, communication channel, what are the existing communication channel in the population level. Then, and then we need to continue with the planning of uh, available intervention or what will be the most appropriate micronutrient interventions to be implemented. And then we continue with implementation and of course, monitoring and evaluation of those programs. Based on this programmatic implication, we have categorized the terms. So some of the terms uh, we found that are eligible under more than one category. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this is how it looks like the current draft lexicon. We have prepared the draft lexicon in the Excel format, but of course, at the final stage, we will publish it in the web-based user-friendly format. Currently, for the ease of adding uh, new terms and for the feasibility of the revision made, we use the Excel format. In the first column, you can see the list of terms, and then next to it is the original definition that we have 
uh, apply, we have recorded from the original resources. The resource, the reference are found in this slide in the last column. In the Excel file that uh, Megan, uh, our, my, our team has shared in the Google Drive folder is, you can also see the Excel file. In the Excel file, you can see the full annotation of the references. Here, we just mentioned the short uh, author date. So after we have recorded the original definition, we check the definition as I've already mentioned, and we propose the definition for the lexicon. And then we have also noted down whether or not we make changes to the original definition. And if it is the case, we have also provided the note on why or how we made the definite, made the revision on the original definition. And then we have applied the keywords and also the categorization for each term. Next, please. Next. So currently, uh, in by the time we prepare this slide is 150 times, but currently we have a total of 140 times in the draft lexicon. And we found that 54 of them uh, has multiple definition across different resources. And 12 times have been made changes or modification uh, as suggested, as I already mentioned. And in this case, I would like to highlight that the suggestions from experts like all of you, based on your different perspective and different background, uh, different background, the additional suggestion on the additional uh, terms to be included in the lexicon will be really helpful for our work on the lexicon. And then uh, we will continue with how we will get the consensus on the lexicon. We plan to seek the agreement for the terms with multiple definition and those we have made changes. We will use the modified Delphi method. Next, please. In this modified Delphi method, we, we will start with the first round of online survey uh, with the goal to engage the large panel of multidisciplinary experts in the field of micronutrients, food fortification, and other relevant expertise. We will share with the larger group of experts through online survey, which will be through the micronutrient forum newsletter, as well as the personal contact as well. We will share with those larger group of experts on the terms with multiple definitions and the modification to the original definition has been made. And then we will ask the experts to provide the grading for each term and to provide the feedback and comments. And then the responses will be summarized and the terms with more than 75% agreement will be considered as final, while all other terms will be considered as pending. Next, please. And in this round two, we will plan to host the expert panel in which selected expert will be invited from the dinner. And then those expert will be shared with the summary of planning terms from the round one online survey. And then the panelists will have to provide the grading for each planning term and provide feedback. And the terms with more than 75% agreement will be considered as final, while all other terms we also still consider as pending. We hope to finalize or finish the agreement seeking process by online survey and the round two, which is uh, expert panel. But if it is still needed, then we will continue with another round of expert panel following the same procedure like in the first expert panel. Next, please. And then we will, uh, after that, we will finalize the lexicon based on the feedback and response from the online survey and the expert panel and we will publish the lexicon, the consensus lexicon on the DINA website in a user-friendly and easily sizable format. I here would like to highlight that the lexicon we should consider as a living document and make it dynamic so that we can uh, later, at later stage, we can add new terms, additional terms based on the updated information that we will be obtaining. And then we also, plan to publish the methodology paper on the lexicon development in a peer review journal. These are the next steps that we will go through with the lexicon development. And with that, I'd like to end up my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Back to you, Megan. Great, thank you so much, Lenmar. Are there any questions from those of you on this call? I imagine if you follow the micronutrient forum and um, the Dina emails, you will see a call for participation in the Delphi method for this in the coming weeks. Um, Ken, please go ahead.
you're on mute. Uh, you just missed my thanking both of you for the presentation. I, it was really helpful to hear um, where you are in the development of the, the, the lexicon. And uh, just a couple quick reactions. One, um, I, I think it would be useful in the lexicon if you can provide a link to the original references, um, the, the sources and the definitions. And I don't know if that's contemplated, but I think for people who will be using the lexicon, they may want to refer back to those original documents. Uh, second, um, in cases where you are proposing a change in a definition or whether the, or where there may be multiple definitions, I think you should actively seek out the original sources, those definitions, so that they have an opportunity to respond to any suggested changes that you are proposing. And then a final comment, um, given the emphasis on large-scale food fortification in the lexicon, I, I just wanted to um, confirm my belief that uh, the micronutrient form is really agnostic to any particular intervention strategy um, in any particular setting. That it, that, that's really a national decision based on what the circumstances are in a particular country. And so um, I, I think part of the objective of the lexicon is to bring terminology into, into more general consideration uh, across different fields or across different interventions. But this current emphasis on large-scale food fortification certainly doesn't mean to exclude any other possible approaches to um, micronutrient intervention programs. So if you could just con confirm that um, issue. Thank you. Thank you. Would Mara, I'll let you respond. Yes. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Ken, for your comments. Uh, for the first point that we did include the original uh, link for the original references in the Excel file, so, so that the readers can easily go through the link to, to see the original references. And for, yes, thank you for your suggestion to seek or co confirm with the original uh, source for any modification or multiple definition made. I'm not sure whether how, uh, whether we can make it for all the different terms, but uh, we, will, we will discuss about that. And for the focus, or particular focus on the last scale food fortification, we try to, since very beginning, when, when I start engaging this work, uh, read, read, and we have discussed about that. Of course, it, the terms mentioned that micronutrient and last scale food fortification data lexicon, but we, it doesn't mean that we neglect the importance of all other definitions in addition to the food fortification. That's why we try to include other interventions as well, like dietary diversification and uh, supplementation as well. But thank you for reminding us. We'll make sure to include all the terms in that will cover all different aspects of micronutrient interventions. Thank you. And I'll just also confirm that we do have some focus on large scale food fortification, but absolutely we do intend to be more agnostic. Um, and certainly the forum is agnostic to nutrition interventions for micronutrients. Um, any other questions or comments for the wind mark? All right, we will move on then. I will pass the screen over to uh, Reed to present the barriers and enablers for data success. Thanks, Megan. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So one of the first activities uh, we wanna do with Dina, in addition to the work that uh, Lewin Marja shared on the lexicon, as well as um, some of the landscaping that has been discussed earlier, is to really understand uh, how to facilitate the maturation of a micronutrient and large-scale food fortification data ecosystem. Um, how do we lift up the entire ecosystem? Um, to do that, I think we have to understand the challenges across a variety of contexts, uh, nationalities, um, governmental approaches, um, 
uh, food systems contexts um, to understand what has caused and maintained the micronutrient data gap. Um, we want to do this so that the problem or problems we seek to address are clear and well documented um, and so that DINA can develop a roadmap and so that others working in the field who are adjacent to uh, micronutrient data uh, understand the problems as well. So uh, the answer to how do we identify those um, specific problems uh, or those specific barriers is a variety of approaches. So we started with the understanding and collective knowledge of the issues by those already engaged at the forum, um, reaching out to other experts like Lewin Marr, um, retaining Megan's expertise when we launched uh, DINA um, to just understand the existing perspective on the issues. We had conversations with stakeholders, which um, evolved into these formal stakeholder convenings, the fourth of which we're in the midst of. But we also think it's appropriate to take more of a structured problem solving approach um, to not just do uh, uh, conversations and heuristic analysis, but to really try to apply the appropriate uh, approach to quantify the problem. So uh, if you go to the next slide, before we do that, I want to give uh, an explanation and a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, we have landed on this idea that the micronutrient and LSFF data ecosystems are immature. And we don't mean that the data is immature. And we certainly don't mean that the individuals collecting and using the data are immature. Rather, the linkages between the data, between the data actors, um, and the way we use it could be strengthened and could be elevated. And that would serve to help everybody involved. So we want to help facilitate the maturation of the ecosystem, um, but certainly that should not be viewed as a pejorative. So as we seek to do that, we identified that the best um, approach to um, identifying the bottlenecks and opportunities was um, something called root cause analysis. So if you go to the next slide, um, this was popularized by the Toyota Motor Corporation in the 70s when they really um, re redefined how uh, reliability in, in auto manufacturing is, is thought about. And it's an interactive inductive technique developed to um, facilitate problem solving by identifying causal factors. So anybody who has children or nieces or nephews, or in my case, a very precocious neighbor will be uh, familiar with being asked why over and over and over again until you get to the point where there's either you don't know the answer or there's a very, very specific answer. And that's essentially the, the same as the uh, root cause analysis, is that you uh, go to the place where a problem exists and then you ask subject matter experts and those involved why several times until you get to the actual causal factors, the actual root cause. Um, so for example, um, you know, we understand that collecting biochemical status data is expensive, but certainly the cost of collecting nationally representative data is not greater than national governments. So it's not in and of itself that it's too expensive. It's that it's not being prioritized. Is that because the people prioritizing the budget don't appreciate the importance of biochemical status data? Is it because the requests are being made at the wrong time in the budget cycles? Um, is it because there aren't facilities nationally and the shipping causes the price to be too high? These are just examples of trying to dig down from it's too expensive to more of the causal factors and what we hope to do in the root cause analysis. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, there's a couple of areas of inquiry. So to conduct root cause analysis, you need to go to the place where the problem exists. And we believe we've identified um, three areas where the problems might exist to start this analysis. The first one is the availability of data. Um, policies and programs require recent data that's appropriately st stratified um, that is both, this includes both biochemical status data as well as um, M&E data. And we think that that collection, curation, and exchange in the DINA data worldview um, is not necessarily happening uh, to create the data that we need. The second place uh, for an area of inquiry is in that data analysis. So in the cases where recent data that is appropriately segmented does exist, we don't think it's always being uh, analyzed to the greatest extent possible. 
So do the skills exist? Do the people uh, have access to the data? Is it interoperable with other important data? And then finally, um, the will and coordination to develop evidence-based policies and programs. So again, in the cases where data does exist, where it is appropriately and rigorously analyzed, is it being turned into policy and programs uh, appropriately? And I thought this uh, addition of the word coordination was very important here, because although there might be will to take action on this um, insights from the analyzed data, uh, as we all know, developing micronutrient interventions at a national or subnational level is a non-trivial activity and requires coordination amongst a variety of actors. And we think that that may very well be the, the point of failure. So the goal is to conduct a root cause analysis in a variety of contexts uh, amongst actors and stakeholders who have responsibilities across the uh, data value chain inside these area of, uh, areas of inquiry to identify um, what we think is causing this uh, existence and persistence of the data gap. So I'll stop here and see um, first if Megan or Luinmar have anything to add to uh, this root cause analysis, but also to see if there's any questions from the group about this proposed methodology. Um, and then I think we've also got some specific follow-up questions to ask to help facilitate conversation. Megan, anything to add, or are there any questions or comments by the from the group? The only thing I would add is that we have a poll too to get your feedback as well. So that could go up now, um, just to see the gr group's thoughts. Um, so I'll add that up shortly. So maybe I can uh, give one or two comments and. Nice to see you, Luin Ma. It's been a while. <laughs> um, and, I mean, thanks for that presentation. So, so maybe mine is just more of um, concurrence in terms of um, agreeing with what you have um, presented. I mean, the three key issues that you actually bring out are real um, in terms of uh, data availability, the analysis. Analysis challenges in terms of capacity, or even just understanding where. Can you hear me now? Ah, uh, yes, it's much better. We lost it, cut out a little yeah. bit in the middle. Yeah, I had some interference with the network. Yeah, so um, so my my comment around these areas of inquiry, I think it is. I don't know how you'll go about it. Um, and I'm just want to put the perspective of, um, of course, my environment and uh, having, especially on the issue of um, probably doing a stakeholder marking with regards to available data. Um, when you talk about availability of data, it means there is a need to reach out to the different um, players and stakeholders who actually are in possession of data. And this is data both at individual level, institutional level. And we also take cognizant that students do collect a lot of information that we probably don't fall back to. So I don't know how, how this will be done. I, I'm just putting this here to think through, um, to, to just see how, what would be the best way to actually have access of just being having a framework of knowing which data exists, how does it look like, who, who is in possession of this data, how can it be accessed, um, does it require a certain um, understanding or uh, some documentation to show. So I don't know, I'm just thinking wide, but I know because I've done this before in terms of trying to access data. And sometimes it is quite challenging. So it's it's one of those areas that I think uh, some, some serious thought on how to get this really needs to be put into place. Because I think once you have the data, then analyzing then becomes not such a problem if the data is very clear. Now, the last component of the will and coordination to develop uh, uh, evidence-based policies and programs. Um, so we have two areas to look at. One is first of all, to set up systems for that coordination um, at national level probably, and see who can, who is best placed. Uh, I know in some countries, there probably exist forums already in place, which can actually manage that, that process of coordination. 
Uh, and especially when you look at the focus on food fortification, we have food fortification alliances across uh, various countries. So those could quite be um, important coordination mechanisms that can start off, you know, to, as a start off to see where to head. But I think the bigger challenge is the bit of um, developing the evidence-based policy program. So from my end, I think the best approach that you might think about is you have to start off from a point of capacity building on evidence-based policy formulation. Um, because that turns out to be sometimes one of the weak points that uh, you have data, you have outputs, and you think this can inform policy, but how do you engage the policymakers to actually get this information so that you translate your data into a, in a manner that the policymakers can understand? So, so we look at it from that perspective. How do we engage the policymakers? How do we ensure that even those who have the data know how to engage the policymakers for them to actually acknowledge the importance of this data? Uh, in countries where you have national and subnational governments, you also have a bit of you know, issues that you have to think across that, that sometimes you want to have this trickle down to the national, to the county or the, the subnational governments, but the, that link between national and subnational becomes also a challenge. So just to think through about that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think capacity building and coordination and really thinking. Um, one of the things we'd love to see is more subnational data. Um, so hopefully that will also be part of the future as well. So Alita, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering how uh, the work of Dina will align with other um, yeah, entities such as the Sun Network, for instance, uh, because I have the feeling, especially at point three, Sun will also have an important role there. So how will you align? Yeah. Can you, Reed, do you want to respond? Yeah, can you repeat the, the last part of the question, please? Well, my question is merely, is there a plan to align with, with Sun? Uh, so I think there's a couple of ways we hope to work with Sun and other partners. And the first, uh, or the perhaps the most important is through, uh, through the national engagement. So while the Micronutrient Forum and DINA, um, we don't have national offices at the Micronutrient Forum um, or country directors. And so we hope to work through partners. Um, I think Sun is one, Nippin uh, is another, uh, and Data Dent, who have strong national relationships. And there are stakeholders who already see the importance uh, of micronutrient data. Um, there's some other touch points between the Micronutrient Forum and Sun, um, particularly around our global conference. Um, the Sun Network. Um, and so I think we're developing uh, the relationship with the those Sun countries um, in a way that will lead to increased collaboration with DINA. Um, at the moment, we don't have anything specific, but that's certainly on our radar. And um, the method of working at the forum is through, uh, through and with partners. Okay, good to hear. Thanks. Yeah, good, good suggestion. Thank you. I also saw that Osman had uh, unmuted himself. So would you like to say anything? Or was that an accidental unmute? Um, well, we've also put up the response to the poll. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, all of the above seems to have almost unanimous support. Um, it's good, I guess, to hear that we were kind of hopefully uh, coalescing around the same three main issues um, that seem to be heard across the world. Um, we've seen pretty similar responses in other um, meetings as well. Uh, Ken, please go ahead. Uh, just to add to the areas of inquiry, and I thought Zip Zipler was going to speak to this, and she had mentioned this earlier, but the issue of data quality doesn't seem to be on your list of critical issues. And, and I think that needs to remain in the discussion. Thank you, that's a, that's a great point. I think we view that as a subset of data availability that the available data must be appropriately segmented and of good quality, but I think it's worth calling that out more specifically. It's a great point, thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. And I see in the capacity development that being a, a main feature there in 
understanding how to have high quality data and then how to analyze it appropriately and making sure that that capacity is there. Any other feedback from those on the call? Um, Yes, I still have a question and it's- Oh, sure, I'm so sorry. I thought that was a previously raised hand. Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question is, was triggered by an earlier question from Ken on the lexicon, because I saw also in, in the presentation by Reed that there's an emphasis on, on large scale food fortification. And just out of curiosity, why is that highlighted? Um, because other interventions seem equally important. So why is large-scale food fortification highlighted? So we've started with a focus on large-scale food fortification for three reasons. Um, the first is that if you think very broadly about nutrition data or micronutrient data, it um, sort of encompasses all the world's data. Um, and you know we had to pick some place to start. Um, the second reason is I think there's a renewed interest in large scale food fortification amongst particularly the three um, agencies that recently came out with a commitment to increase their reach. Um, I think that was UNICEF, WHO and the Gates Foundation. Um, so I think that renewed interest um, made the timing of picking LSFF as a starting point reasonable. And then the third and um, reason is that the DINA is currently uh, the largest funder is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, they are very focused on large scale food fortification in their uh, current strategy. So while we um, aim to ensure that DINA is broader um, than just large scale food fortification, and while the point that Ken made about the forum being um, agnostic amongst you know, evidence-based interventions uh, is correct, um, we still do have to be responsive to the, the requirements of the funders. Um, I also think that there is an element of large scale food fortification, since it is a population based uh, intervention that has to be responsive to diet quality and to other interventions. Um, since it's, you can't modulate it at the individual level, since it's a population intervention, you have to think about um, excess or toxicity. And so that means that thinking through LSFF requires you to think through um, the other uh, interventions as well. So in that, from that perspective, focusing on LSFF predicates some knowledge and information on other um, complementary um, or parallel interventions as well. Um, so we thought it was a reasonable starting point uh, for all of those reasons. Yeah, okay, I understand, fair enough. I was just wondering if that may, yeah, also um, trigger some non-response to your effort um, by people who are maybe not so much involved in large-scale food fortification or think it is not, um, yeah, equally divided over all the possible interventions or may be more favorable to other interventions. Yeah, that, that's a risk for certainly, um, although I suspect that risk exists no matter where we selected to start. Um, that's true. <laughs> so, but that, that is true. And we're, you know, we're trying to be very careful about how we frame DINA. And we're always talking about micronutrients and large scale food fortification. So certainly there's some data that's LSFF specific, you know, about production and uh, industrially milled quantities of vehicles. Um, but, you know, the diet quality and um, nutrient gaps and prevalence of deficiency, we think will hopefully be uh, are broader and will engage that broader audience. But it's a, that's a very good point. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Great. Any other comments or thoughts on um, the root cause analysis or really trying to understand some of the, the barriers and enablers to data collection analysis and use. Mm -hmm. Can I just raise a, 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 a <laughs> I'm not sure this is entirely relevant to micronutrients, but it's, we're talking about um, availability of data and, and mm -hmm. uh, 
um, that obviously includes things like BMI. I just wanted to I just wanted to see what the group feel about an idea that's popped into my head, and that's the thought of, of instead of doing instead of when we measure BMI, which was we um, it's not part of micronutrients, but part of normal. Um, I'm sorry if I'm going to go out go out of that micronutrients, but obesity being a problem in Peru. But um, I I just wondered whether anybody has thought about doing measuring BMI with a sitting height rather than a standing height as being a possible better measure to measure whether or not we've got actually um, obesity in the. I'm sorry, this isn't anything to do with micronutrients. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it has to do with getting a better measurement of a BMI that was based on a sitting height rather than a standing height, because you know measuring abdominal um, uh, abdominal circumference isn't terribly easy because it varies a bit how people move and breathe and things. But as I see that this is a group of people who obviously are interested in <laughs> in measuring <laughs> and uh, you know um, undernutrition and overnutrition. I'm sorry if this is if this diverts from from um, uh, micronutrients. We should really have kept the micronutrients. But. No worries. I I don't know that we'll focus so much on BMI in this particular project, just because of the focus on micronutrients. But we are trying to think of more creative ways to collect data. Um, so as you say, you know, taking the measurements sitting down. Um, rather than standing up. These are the types of things that we would like to also see for surveys to make them easier um, to facilitate or do um, anything that might make it easier on the, the data collectors themselves. Um, those are absolutely things that we are pretty interested in, in improving on. Um, I think we may also see surveys added on to DHS collections, um, which may also dovetail pretty well into considerations of BMI and um, overweight and obesity data collection as well. So not that we are cutting anything <laughs> off, but just to uh, maintain our focus, otherwise we'll end up quite broad, but yeah. yeah. I'm sorry to move it off. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. I appreciate the discussion too, because we also have to keep in mind the broader nutrition community as well, um, because there's certainly other nutrients out there. Any other comments or feedback? And also feel free to use the chat box as well, if you like. But All right. So I think if there are no additional comments, um, we can move to the last slide. Um, we'll skip over a couple. Go to slide 37. So I would really like to thank you all for joining us today uh, to hear more about the Micronutrient Data Innovation Alliance. I really hope you will consider becoming a member. You can use the forum link uh, from the chat or find it on our website. We'll also be promoting this through the newsletter of the Micronutrient Forum and the soon to be newsletter of Dina. Um, so we hope that you'll stay engaged and help us as we continue to shape uh, what the Alliance will look like and the individual activities. Um, so I really appreciate all of your time. If you do think of any additional um, feedback or things that you would like to have said on the call but didn't have a chance to, please feel free to email us. There's an email at the bottom of that membership form that's dina at micronutrientforum.org. Um, so feel free to email us there. Um, and that's a good way to get a hold of us. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate your time and attention. Thank so, you. Everyone. Thank you, Megan. You, you made us think. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> bye. Take care, all. Bye bye.